So thank you all very much for attending, being here. I wanted to start out, um, we want to hear a little bit from Sally. After all, this is pretty rare. Is this the first time you've been to New Vrindavan? No, I've been here many times. <laughs> and somehow we've missed you. So, Sally, can you tell us about your first exposure to Prabhupada? When you first came to find out he was coming and what you thought about that? Um, yes, I. Uh, my husband is Indian. He's from Agra, and his father is a very big and astute businessman. And he always thought of what he called schemes, and they he would send the idea to us, and we would do what we were supposed to do and send it off back, and knew nothing would ever become of it. <laughs> well, we got a letter one day, and uh, in 1965. And uh, he asked if we could sponsor a Swami that he was going to send over. And uh, sure, uh, because I was the citizen, my husband was not an American citizen yet. I was the citizen, I was the sponsor. But we did what he And we sent it all back, knowing nothing would ever become of it. <laughs> Look at this. <laughs> fantastic. Really fantastic. <laughs> Any more questions? <laughs> Had you seen any pictures? Did you have any idea what he looked like yet? Uh, no. He sent one picture just before he arrived. And it was the ugliest thing. <laughs> Scariest, ugliest. Did you ever see it? If I find it, I will send it to you, okay? <laughs> because it was scary and I just could not imagine. I, I heard you called your husband up, he was at work, and you said, I just got the picture of the man who's coming, and you were a little shocked. Yeah, I, I called him up at work, and he said, I said, listen, honey, <laughs> sit down. You won't believe this. He's coming. <laughs> and it is the ugliest thing I ever saw. It's scary. So... Anyway, something did become of it, and uh, we're very fortunate that, that it did. What, what, what time did he arrive at your home, and did you go meet him? And he came down on the bus, so did you meet him? We had at, at the bus bus a meet him in New York, and they put him on a bus for Pittsburgh. And my husband then went down from Butler to meet him and bring him home. Um, the first day was, he probably came around 4 o'clock, maybe 6 o'clock. He slept on our couch in the living room. And then the next day, he went to the YMCA. Because we had two children and only two bedrooms. So we just didn't have room. And it was good. It was a good thing because when he was staying there at our place, he would come early in the morning and have breakfast and he came after my husband left for work and then he came early and then he fixed this enormous lunch and then after he ate lunch then he went back to the Y to continue his work of translating so and then he came about six o'clock every night and fixed himself a small meal. And uh, because we figured that would be more palatable because we cook meat. And uh, he didn't have to smell the meat, you know. So um, he cooked himself a small thing. Uh, Do you remember what, what his cooking utensil was like? Oh, that's that 
that tall thing, it'll only cook <laughs> one burner, one burner, and you put some doll in the bottom, and then with water, and then vegetables, 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 about four or five layers, <laughs> and they cooked with one, they cooked with one burner. That is wonderful, I thought, it's just a great thing. Most anyway. of you know about Srila Prabhupada's cooker, the thing, you know, the cooker. And then I realized, you know, after one day, I realized, hey, he's a good cook. <laughs> <laughs> I think, Swami, would you mind cooking lunch for Gopal and me too? <laughs> so every lunchtime was a big fit, feast <laughs> with not a uh, Swami's cooking. It was fun. And he did other things. I have certain recipes that he gave me, that he made before me, and I wrote the message, the uh, recipes down. I have a great one for Kier. Do you know what Kier is? <laughs> I have Swami's recipe for Kier. <laughs> and, uh, Am I answering the question or going too far? No. <laughs> Can you tell us a little bit about what he, what you remember that he brought with him? Did he have a lot of things? He brought a big black rain umbrella. <laughs> he, he brought his slippers that he had on his feet. He brought uh, two pieces of material that he wrapped around his body. <laughs> Did he have, um... I think maybe a shawl. Yeah. That's, I think it, that's it. The cooker. I mean, he came with absolutely nothing. But he came with a ton of books. <laughs> In trunks. <laughs> and his one purpose in coming was to sell those books. He had translated and printed three, three of them. And they, he had, um, there were a total of 16. And they, he had printed three. He had translated three more. But he didn't have the money to, you know, uh, print them. And he needed the money to translate, to, to live. So his purpose was not that you would guess. It was not to start an organization like this, but to sell the books so he could publish more. His uh, big philosopher, I forget his name, uh, told him to take the Gita to the English world. And he did. That was his goal in life. Not you guys. It just happened. By someone else's plan. I understand that um, Srila Prabhupada was there when your son took his first steps. Oh, yes, Bridge, B-R-I-J. Um, he was about six months old, seven months, eight months. You, many of you have seen that picture that the uh, little dark-haired boy was hanging on to Swami, and the Swami was laughing and laughing and laughing. He was delightful with the children, really. He was a delight just to watch. And he just warmed up when he played with the kids. It was nice. I remember a letter that Srila Prabhupada wrote to you on the occasion of your daughter's third birthday. Oh, I don't remember that. Um, <laughs> An invitation to the Mumbai temple, and his cousin lives there. 
and acted in the Prayer of Shiva Temple. And man, was he just treated royally. Rich. Because he chewed on the Swami's shoes. <laughs> so, Srila Prabhupada said, my dear, this is in um, November 3rd. And my dear daughter Sally, I thank you very much for your letter of the ninth instant, and I'm very glad to know that your little Bijo, Bijo we call him, it's an affectionate name, is growing to be more adventurous nowadays. Generally, the son acquires the qualities of the mother, and the daughter acquires the quality of the father, and such children become happy in life. You have acquired the qualities oh, lost. You, have you have acquired the qualities of your intelligent father and your son will be as intelligent as you are and thus your son will be as good and noble as your father I wish that you will be happy more and more with your growing children you can also you can take me also as old Bijou <laughs> And therefore, even in my ripe old age, I have taken some adventurous tasks. And as your little Bijou requires your help always in his little adventures, so also your old Bijou requires your help in his adventures in America. Just wait, there's... Uh, I'm not as fast on the, these things. Okay. This was a few, a little later, 65, November 65, my dear daughter Sally. I beg to thank you for your kind letter of the 16th instant and have noted the contents carefully. I am still more glad to learn that you are going to observe the third birthday of Miss Kamala Agarwal on Saturday next. On this occasion, I should have presented her some ornaments. But as I am a sannyasi, I can simply offer my blessings for her long life and good prosperity. She cannot now read, otherwise at least I should have presented a set of my books. <laughs> but you set aside one set of my books, because Prabhupada left books in their, in their place. And sometimes he would request, like he sent a letter earlier, 25 sets to be sent to New York Paradox or Paradon, that you know, the bookstore there. So they were managing some of the books in Prabhupada would write and they would send. I forgot about that. You set aside one set of my books for her future reading, but she will grow up a beautiful, educated girl with good consciousness. I am obliged to your good daughter. This is very sweet. I am obliged to your good daughter for awarding me a good degree at. Swami Jesus. <laughs> she was calling him Swami Jesus, which, which is actually a great honor for me. Sometimes the Lord speaks through an innocent child, and I take this honor as being sent by Lord Jesus through an innocent child, free from all formalities of the current society. Lord Jesus preached the message of God, and I have taken up the same mission, and it would be... And it would... Oh, Krishna... It would be good luck. It would be good luck for me if I can follow the footsteps of Lord Krishna, who preached the message of God in spite of all persecution. Lord Jesus is a living example how one has to suffer in this material world simply on the matter of preaching the message of God. In Bhagavatam also, there is another example like Lord Jesus. He is Pavad Maharaj, a boy of five years old. But because he was a great devotee of God and preaching the message of God among his little classmates, his atheist father tried to kill him. So the atheist class of men are always inimical to the devotees of God, even though such devotees happen to be atheist sons like Pavad. So this was the wonderful letter. Um, there are three letters here in the database from 65, so this was the third one. In the one before this, 
don't know if you remember, he gives her an instruction, he gives her an idea, not like so much of an instruction, to start a restaurant, her and her husband should start a restaurant, and he'll supply them over 200 recipes, and then that uh, way will be a great success. We were supposed to open one in New York. Yeah. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> um, that would be tough. We were better off as a teacher than an engineer. <laughs> In a little town. How did so? How did you feel when when Swamiji left left Butler to go oh, back to New York? It was just it was frightening. We were I cried. Bill Pell cried because he knew nothing about how hectic and difficult New York would be. Nothing, and he didn't know anything about putting money in a machine and getting something, some food or something, and Gopal handed him a big handful of coins, all types of, you know, nickels, dimes, quarters, so that he could buy food or a drink or anything, a bath. He took a bath about seven times a day. <laughs> And he did not know how to take a bath in a bus, bus station, you know. So Gopal went to great uh, effort to teach him, to show him how to do this. And I can remember this was all standing in the front door with his suitcase or whatever he had to take. And just, I was crying and he was crying and it was just, ugh. I hated to see him go, old man. Oh, I guess he did okay. <laughs> wow. There's another letter I couldn't locate, but it's written while he was in the office building on 72nd Street. At a certain point, he was in New York City in an office building, living in a small office, the space that had been given to him to use. In an office building, you don't have a full-on bath. So he had to walk from that place to Mishra's apartment, which I think was seven blocks. These are New York City blocks, which means they're quite long. And that was to cook and to take baths. Otherwise, he was just in this little office space. And he wrote this letter, and he was mentioning, first, when the winter came, he saw the snow, and he was shocked because he first, he, when he first saw that snow, he thought there'd been a whitewash. Like in India, they take this <laughs> white mixture, and they just throw it on everything. And um, you can imagine, and he, he wasn't prepared physically with the proper clothing. No, didn't have any clothes. Sheets. <laughs> but the part that was very, actually for my heart, painful was he was explaining to her the nights he was so he's in that building and it was cold, long nights and no, no way to cook, no way to keep anything and he said sometimes he was feeling so hungry at night. You know, we sometimes have no perspective on what, you know, we kind of say, oh, we came over in the boat with nothing, and da da da, you know, it almost sounds romantic. But when you think about it, what he actually was going through, we have really little clues. And when you actually read something like that, where he's admitting that he was hungry at night, it's no. very painful to the heart. And at that same time, that would have been. You know, I was like some stupid little hippie tripping around in Ashbury or in New York or not New York, but in Oregon, you know, totally full of ignorance. So we're very grateful to you, Sally, that you welcomed him and you, we're also grateful that you sent him back to New York. <laughs> but it, all of us, all of us are a result of that. Thank you. It, but he made his own way. That is so impressive. He made his own way. How many people can do that? Wow. Thank you very much.